So we were discussing chemical reactions, and we went through this equation and identified basically the inadequate the parts of it. We know what the arrow is, we know the coefficients, reactants, and products. One of the things that we need to remember as we go from pro uh, reactants to products is that matter is going to be conserved. So if it's on this side, it has to end up on this side of the equation as well. Same number of atoms, same number of subatomic particles, everything goes from one side of the equation to the other, just to three orders. couple different types of reactions that can occur. There is a reaction called a complete reaction, and this indicates that all reactants will go to the products. So once the reaction starts, all reactants go to products. This is symbolized as the single-headed arrow in that one direction. Complete reactions are not very common in biology. What's more common in biology are what are known as reversible reactions. And the reversible reactants, we have our reactions, we're going to have our reactants that will go towards product, but then product will fluctuate back towards reactant. And so we have sort of the forward reaction, the reverse reaction occurring simultaneously, fluctuating back and forth, and we represent that with the double arrow. Now, there are complete reactions that we may run into, but we're going to run into a lot more reversible reactions, especially when we begin to look at provisional cycles, things like glycolysis, electron transport chain, Krebs cycle, photosynthesis. Now, these reversible reactions, they are going to be affected by the reactant concentration. Okay, so as we increase concentration of the reactants, so in this case, more hydrogen and more oxygen, what invariably we're going to do is increase the collisions, interactions, and the rates of the chemical reaction. So if I have like a million hydrogen molecules and two oxygen molecules, I'm going to mostly be having hydrogens interact, right? Occasionally the oxygens can interact with the hydrogen when they form a little bit of water, but it's going to be very slow. Rate. Whereas if we have millions of hydrogen and millions of oxygens, the interaction between the oxygen and the hydrogen increases the rate of water production increases in this chemical kind of production as well. The reversible reaction, not only is it affected by the reactant concentration, but it also is going to be influenced by the product concentration. So the product concentration, as we increase on that side of the equation, can begin to reverse the reaction in the other direction. So if we have an influence by the reactants and an influence by the product, we can begin to measure or evaluate how much influence each of those parts of the equation have. More reactant, more product, the same. And so we can look at the reaction in terms of its direction and whether we have more reactant being converted into product, more product being converted into reactant, remember this is for the reversible reactions, or is it balanced and there's no net change in product and reactant concentration. When the reaction direction is balanced, this is referred to as chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium means that if we were counting reactants and products at a given unit of time, we would see no net change in the reactant concentration, 
no net change in the product concentration. Now, this chemical uh, balance or the, the directional balance, even though there may be no net reactant or product to product um, exchange or, or change occurring, does not mean when it's balanced that we have the same concentration of reactants and products. It just means that there's a point in this chemical reaction's life where we could get to chemical equilibrium where the amount of constant or the amount of reactants does not change and the amount of product does not change even though the chemical is still going. So the product concentration can be really, really small. The reactant product uh, concentration can be really, really high. But the exchange of reactants and products, products and reactants, balances off. And there's no net change. Now there's a little bit of a problem here for biology from getting the chemical equilibrium. So concentrations might be different. They could be the same though as well. You could have equal concentrations on either side and the equation is balanced. Or you could have more reactant, less product, and the rate of reaction is balanced for less reactant, more product, and the rate of reaction is balanced. We get into a chemical equilibrium when the product formation, so this side of the equation or this direction of the equation, reactants forming products, is balanced against the product degradation. Sometimes back in the reverse direction, or it could be because the product is being used in another direction to produce another chemical reaction downstream from this one. If we get to a point where we're balanced and we're not really developing any new products, these reactions downstream are not being fed in ever increasing product, concentration of product. And if that product's being used as reactant for a downstream chemical reaction, that chemical reaction would also balance out. Provisionally, we always have to have an increase in supply of ATP in order to function all of the different chemical reactions we need to increase. And so if I don't have that ever increasing ATP supply that balances out, I lose my ATP supply. And the system shut down, the system went down. So our chemical reactions always need to be in disequilibrium. We need to have reactants producing products in such a way that more products are always being produced so that we always can eventually get down to increasing our concentration or ever increasing our concentration of our energy currency in the cell. Okay. And we'll deal with that idea of when we get to thermodynamics and when we get to uh, metabolism. Just trying to be kind of that broad stroke. Has everybody got all of this? Right, so start a brand new lecture and if you want to name it something you can name it water. So why is water important in terms of biology? Okay, it's vital to life, which is a fair answer, but why is it vital? Okay. Everything that happens in biology happens in water. Right? You have the cell contained in water. If you're a single cell organism, you have water on the inside, there's water on the outside from the atmosphere and the environment. If you're a multicellular organism, you have that environmental component, but you also have water inside your cells, and you water strong in your cells and tissues. So everything happens in water, and then we can have the vital function of our organ systems. Everything comes back to water. So it's important enough that we talk about water. And where we need to start is with water's unique structure. Okay. 
Okay, so water is going to have a very unique structure. Here is a couple different dot diagrams, a bubble diagram, and a chemical structure diagram of water. H2O2 hydrogen is in oxygen. Okay, what do we know about the electronegativity to begin with of these three atoms? What's the electronegativity of oxygen? It's super high. So what does that mean in terms of electrons? The oxygen is pulling more strongly on those electrons. So the electrons are going to spend more time in those shared covalent bonds over by the oxygen side of the molecule. So keep that in mind as we progress here. Say there's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. This is an O. Not a zero. So one O, one oxygen, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. And as we've already alluded to, the oxygen has a very high electronegativity. The hydrogen, much lower electronegativity. So oxygen has a stronger pull on the atoms, or I'm, I'm sorry, on the electrons than the hydrogen. Okay, so because of the electronegativity, the two covalent bonds that are present, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, those are our two covalent bonds. You can see in this figure that our electrons are shared. So here's one covalent bond, here's the other covalent bond. What do we know about those covalent bonds? What do we get from the electronegativity? Those covalent bonds are they nonpolar or polar? They're going to be polar. So water is a polar molecule. So if water is what is the interface of interaction to biological systems, then you know any polar molecule is going to dissolve. Any nonpolar molecule has to be protected. Because lights dissolve lights based off your polarity. Individual molecules of water also are going to interact because of the polar nature of water. And they're going to interact. What kind of bond will they interact with? Hydrogen bonds. Right. So hydrogen bonds can form between our individual molecules of water because of the polar covalent bonds that are present making water molecule polar. Positive on the hydrogen side, negative on the oxygen side of the molecule. Now, one molecule of water, so here's one molecule of water, that individual molecule of water can form four, up to four hydrogen bonds. So four hydrogen bonds. We can get a single hydrogen bond from each of the, um, on each of the hydrogens, and then two hydrogen bonds with the oxygen. So let me kind of draw that out. So this molecule of water right here, we could have the oxygens, the oxygen from one molecule and the oxygen from another molecule form hydrogen bonds here, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then I can have hydrogen forming hydrogen bonds like that with the oxygen. Okay? So each hydrogen forms two bonds to oxygen. The number of valence electrons in oxygen, oxygen is six valence electrons. It has two that are not paired. And so then this the single the single electron with the, with the uh, hydrogen pairs up with one of those unpaired 
we don't so collect bonds. When, like you're connecting the water molecules at the top to that oxygen, how is there, because there's two hydrogens? It's not the, because it's not the electrons that are involved. It's the electronegativity forming the hydrogen. Remember that okay. we have uh, the electron spending more time over here by the oxygen, making this side more negative. Right. And then this side is more positive. The positive and the negative attract. That's the oxygen. That's the hydrogen. That's a great question, though, for clarity. Okay, so because of its polar nature, the unique structure that the water has, water can have some very unique life giving qualities. And I'm going to do my best to describe and to discuss, discuss each of these life giving qualities that are present in water because of its polar nature. First one is going to be that water is very chemically active or reactive. So here's an example, uh, another example from hydrogen box walking between four molecules of water molecule forming four hydrogen bonds. So very chemically reactive. In other words, we can form a lot of hydrogen bonds with water and with other molecules. So it can form hydrogen bonds with itself and other types of molecules as well. Now the characteristics of the hydrogen bonds that can be formed here, they last a very short amount of time. And I've told you this before that it's about a trillionth of a second. So faster than I can snap my finger, the water that you have sitting on your table is forming and reforming bonds trillions and trillions and trillions of times. So even though they are forming and degrading. So even though they're forming and degrading super quickly, those hydrogen bonds over that trillionth of a second still allow there to be a very structured form for water. So they form and they degrade, yet they provide structure. The reason that the structure is formed is because the hydrogen bonds aren't all forming and degrading all at the same time. You have a high percentage of the molecules of water that are forming hydrogen bonds at any given time. But they're just happening in trillionths of a second. So at any given time, we look at one trillionth of a second, 90% may be hydrogen bonds. And then we look at another trillionth of a second, and there's another 90% that are involved in hydrogen bonds, but it's a completely different set of those water molecules that are involved in the forming those hydrogen bonds. So because we are forming and degrading these hydrogen bonds really, really quick, we still get this structured format for our water. And that structure helps us to do two things. One, it creates the ability for water molecules to hold together. We call that cohesion. Literally, these molecules of water are held relatively close together because of forming and degrading hydrogen bonds constantly occur. Cohesion, you go out to the water fountain today, you press it, you get that nice cylindrical stream, right? If we didn't have hydrogen bonds, you'd go out there and it would just spread all over the place. It wouldn't hold together at all. It just completely drenched. You know, it's talking about sharks. Instead, you get this nice stream that is basically the shape of the nozzle, right? So, 
what are some of the things that come from cohesion? Well, if you start to pull on water molecules, let's say moving water up the uh, xylem tube of a tree or pulling water in your blood from the vessels in your toe back up towards your heart, you pull on one molecule of water, others kind of get pulled along because they're being held together by those hydrogen bonds that are forming and reforming. It becomes really important because we got to move water from those uh, roots all the way to the tips of the leaves against the gravitational pull. You have to pull blood from your toes back up towards your heart against the gravitational pull. Part of both of those processes is facilitated because water is cohesive. It holds, water molecules hold together. So we get this chain, so to speak, of water that allows that water in part to travel against gravity, such as in plants or in the vasculature of an organism. So kind of like a chain. Now, in addition to the characteristic, the characteristic of cohesion, water can stick to other surface surfaces or cling to other substances. We call that adhesion. So water can adhere to other surfaces. If I were to dump out Francisco's water here on the table, it would puddle up here on the table. Ethanol, you pour ethanol out, and it spreads across the table. It's all the new property. And it's because ethanol doesn't have the same type of adhesion properties as water. So it clings to other surfaces. This adhesion characteristic creates, such as in this xylem tube, the ability for water also to sort of grab onto the side of the xylem tube. So it's not, not only being pulled up in a chain, but pulled out. So that it's not being pulled as, as much down towards the bottom um, of the earth, towards gravitational uh, pull of the earth. Same thing with the blood, the water in your bloodstream coming up the um, coming up from the toes to the heart. It's holding on to the side of the vessels and that facilitates its movement in part back towards the heart as well. In addition to adhesion and cohesion, because water holds together and creates, it can create a surface with tension. So in a lake, may look something like this, where we have a surface of water. Remember, not only as you go into the depth of the lake are those hydrogen bonds forming, but they're forming at the surface as well. The water molecules at that surface are holding together. And so it creates a tension at that surface, just like this floor right now. I'm not sinking through it because there's tension. But water can form a small amount of tension as well. And there are some organisms, such as this water strider, it can actually utilize that tension to be able to traverse across the surface of the water. Or the basculus lizard, that's the Jesus lizard, which is probably not kind of figure out and run across the, the river. <clears throat> so the surface tension of water is facilitated by the you know, question it's facilitated by those hydrogen bonds that are forming on all the on all those molecules across the surface of the, of the water. So that surface tension becomes slightly more difficult to break. For substances that don't have the same type of surface tension, you can throw a spider or one of these um, Water striders on water, and it's going to be able to sit on the surface. If you throw it in another liquid nitrogen, it doesn't have the surface tension or the temperature or the tension that water has. Throw it in liquid nitrogen, and it would sink and break. It would break that surface because the surface is a lot easier to break. So 
So that boundary between the water and the air you're going to always have water that has those lateral bonds that forms bonds laterally in that water molecules and neighboring neighboring water molecules at that surface form those hydrogen bonds. But also is going to bond going vertically as well towards the depths of a body of water. <coughs> So vertically, or horizontally across the surface, and vertically as we go down. By the way, I don't know if you're working out, I love skipping rocks. And we can skip rocks for that, for that reason. That nice flat rock skimming across the surface, hits that surface connection, it doesn't break and spots. It slows down a little bit. can break that surface. Okay, so very chemically reactive. We have a cohesion, adhesion, surface temperature. Water is also a great temperature regulator. Now, what that means is water really is difficult to change its temperature. To understand a temperature regulator, I have to define two terms. I have to define heat and I have to define temperature. And what you need to know is that heat and temperature are different. They are not measuring the same thing. So we're going to start there and we'll wrap back around to how water is a great temperature regulator. First, let's define temperature. You all are probably familiar with measurements called Fahrenheit and centigrade. These are measurements of temperature. The way that we quantify for Fahrenheit or centigrade is to not look at the temperature as in how hot or cool is it, but to rather look at the molecular motion. So temperature is rather is, is, it's going to be average Yes, eventually. Average molecular speed. In other words, a body of water that's at 25 degrees centigrade has a lower average molecular speed than a body of water that's at 37 degrees centigrade. Okay? So it's molecular speed. How quickly are the molecules moving within that substance? This is probably right around room temperature. I'm not totally tricked out by um, This is room temperature right now. If we were to increase the temperature, we would increase the average molecular speed of the molecules inside of this bottle. Right now, they're moving relatively quickly. But if we increase that molecular speed, we would see an increase in temperature. Okay. When we increase the average molecular speed, that's what results in an increase in temperature. So Fahrenheit, centigrade, the two scales of temperature are simply measuring molecular speed. Um, heat. This is the other term that we need to know about. Heat actually is going to deal with molecular speed, but in reference to quantity. Okay, so it's molecular speed plus quantity. All right. So let's let's start out really, really simple, and then we'll move over here to this figure uh, in just a second. Um, by the way, heat, you probably are going to recognize the, the units that we use to measure heat. Uh, you're most familiar with the calorie or the kilocalorie. 
more accurate is the Jewel, the Jewel, J-O-U-L-E, which is a measure of heat. All right, so I want, I want you to work with me here. I'm going to give you five molecules here, and I'm going to give you five molecules here. The temperature, what is temperature? Average, average molecular speed. So let's say these molecules are moving around fast. So they're bouncing all over the place. And they're moving over here slow. The molecules are moving slow here. The molecules are moving fast here. Which has the higher temperature? Fast. OK. Now, heat also deals with the quantity. So I have fast moving molecules here. What's my quantity here? Five. So I have five fast moving molecules. So let's call that heat hot. Over here, how many molecules do I have? Five. It's the same as I have over here, right? But they're much slower. So now I'm taking the molecular speed, which is slow, the same quantity. The quantities are exactly the same. So the heat here would be. I don't hear confidence. Low. low. It's going to be low. Low and slow. So, what happens now if I take these five molecules that are moving slow, and let's say instead of five, I have a hundred of those molecules, all still moving at the same slow speed? Temperature is going to be slow. So it's still going to be the same temperature, right? Because I have not changed the average molecular speed. What have I done to heat? I've increased it because I've increased the quantity. And so at 100 molecules, chances are this is going to be higher heat, even higher heat than over here, just because I've increased the molecules. Even though I haven't changed their average molecular speed, heat is a measure of the average molecular speed and the quantity. So let's say that I put in some numbers. And let's say that these molecules are moving at 100 miles an hour. Okay, so pretty high speed for those molecules to be moving around. So that's going to relate to their fast temperature or their higher temperature. So let's say this equates to 37 degrees centigrade. Okay, and I'm just making up numbers right now to try to illustrate the points. I don't go home and try to study all these numbers and then go somewhere. I'm trying to get the proof of concept here for you. So these are much slower, so let's say that they're 50 miles per hour. Okay, And really, the miles per hour, I don't even need. Let's just say we quantify the speed at 100 and we quantify the speed at 50. So 100 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour, all of these molecules are moving. So now I can begin to look at a quantity of heat, molecular speed plus the quantity. So let's add them all up. I get 500. Okay, so there's my quantity. We're going to just arbitrarily call it 500. Over here, I add up all five of those 50 mile an hour molecules, and I end up with 250. So you can plainly see that the speed's higher here, the speed is lower here. Now I go over here. They're still 50, but now it's 100 molecules. And so that's 5,000. Okay. Is everybody kind of seeing the difference between temperature and heat? So let's go over here. If I have a cup of water at 25 degrees and a bucket of water at 25 degrees, temperature is more or less or equal. Temperature. 25 and 25. Equal. How about the heat? Where do I have more heat? No, more heat. The bucket. In the bucket, just because of sheer quantity, right? Because there's going to be many more, many more molecules in that bucket than compared to the cup. Now, notice what happens here. If I put in 50,000 joules, that's our measurement of heat, notice that the temperatures change very differently. 
I now have hot water here. We're in well in excess of 25 degrees centigrade. Whereas over here in my larger bucket, I now only have warm water. So where's where where's the higher temperature? The smaller bucket's higher temperature. Where's more heat? In the bucket, just because still it's a lar much larger quantity of molecules. Notice I put in the same amount of heat, but I had two different changes in the temperature based off of the quantity that's present. So the heat was exactly the same, but here I got boiling water and here it probably just barely warm water. Okay? So the same amount of heat. So why why is there such a difference here? The reason is is because when you add heat, heat begins to change the average molecular speed. So going back over here to this figure, if I take and I add heat in here, I only have five molecules that I have to increase the molecular motion to see an increase in temperature. Whereas over here, 100 molecules have to be influenced now. So it's just kind of like pushing on this door. If I go and I just push with a very small amount, I can I'm kind of hurt my finger a little bit. But if I give it more force, it's going to swing wide open. But if I change the size of the door, I probably wouldn't even be able to budge it with just my finger because I don't have as much force that's being imputed onto the system. So here, by adding more heat into a lower number of molecules, you get a greater increase in temperature because all of that heat can go towards increasing molecular speed of just a few molecules, whereas you have to distribute that heat across a much larger number of molecules over there. Okay? Lake Superior, it's huge, right? Biggest lake in the world by surface area. Lake Superior is always going to be one of our biggest heat sinks in North America. You go out to the oceans, even bigger heat sinks. Meaning you can put a lot of heat into the ocean and you will have very small changes in temperature. Whereas if I take the same amount of heat and put it into a cup of water, it's going to cause that water to begin to boil. So water is a great regulator of temperature because when you increase heat in a large body of water, you have a very small amount of temperature change. Other substances that aren't as great at uh, regulating temperature, ethanol. If I take ethanol and I had a faint ocean of ethanol, I could get that to evaporate really, really quick by just adding a little heat. Because it's not the same regulator of temperature. So then the question becomes, why is it such, why is water such a great regulator of temperature? Why can you add so much heat but have very small amount of change in temperature? The answer, hydrogen bonds. So, when you increase heat, if I put heat into water, it will not change in, by a large amount of temperature, especially really big bodies of water, like oceans and large places. If I put a bunch of heat into Lake Superior, like let's say this whole summer it was 90 degrees, all the way through the summer, on every day adding a large amounts of heat, the temperature may only go up 100 degrees. Whereas if it was an ethanol body, that 90 degrees pumping in there, it would change from 25 degrees centigrade to hundreds of degrees of centigrade, it's not very good because all that heat is going towards moving molecules. So it all comes back down to hydrogen bonds. Probably. Because we don't have, we would have this, these big surface areas where we can put heat into it and not have a great change in, in um, temperature. You go out to the parking lot, you have a kiddie pool. <laughs> Put that kiddie pool right out there on the blacktop. And 
step on the blacktop in the middle of summer, like yesterday when it was like 90 degrees, that blacktop is hot, right? You go and you get into the water, it's in the exact same heat temperature, 90 degrees. You get in that water, the water maybe 70 degrees. Due to a bigger body of water with more molecules, more quantity, and it's not going to change at all. Lake Superior. 90 years, I've spent a lot of time in Lake Superior. I lived right on Lake Superior for six years of my life. Yeah, so I've spent a lot of time in Lake Superior. In the middle of summer, it could have been 90 degrees every day for weeks on end. The black top is like 90 degrees. You go out there and blitz in your feet because it's so dead hot. You go to Lake Superior, it's 70 degrees, 70 degrees, 70 degrees, 70 degrees, every day, day after day after day, even though it's just radiated with all of that heat. So heat, it's the molecular speed plus the quantity. And so delta, that means change. So you would read that. How do you change temperature or change temperature? The way to change temperature is to change the heat. So if we want to reduce, we can remove heat. So in the wintertime, we're getting ready to go into fall. Pretty soon we'll be in the winter. Temperatures drop. Air temperature begins to drop. We begin to remove heat from the surface of water. So changing temperature, we have to remove heat. Consider you're sitting around, you got a nice coat. Lots of coat with ice. As the ice melts, it absorbs the heat. So as it is absorbing the heat, what's happening to happening to the average molecular speed of the molecules of coat? I'm absorbing the coke is slowing down because I'm absorbing heat out of the mixture, right? So as the melt, as the ice melts, it's melting because it's absorbing heat. And as it's absorbing heat, it's pulling that heat away from whatever the solution is that it's in or the, the air that it's around in this big pile of ice outside. And so that coke that you're drinking, the soda molecules or the coke molecules, decrease in molecular speed. So we use pearl ice in a coke, it's not really to have that ice that's cold to the touch to cool down the coke, it's to absorb the heat from the coke to reduce the molecular speed of the molecules. The ice molecules are going to speed up at a much slower rate than the molecules of ice, or the molecules of soda as they cool down. And I'm going to, I'm going to get there in, well, maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll get there hopefully before the end of today. I'll, I'll get there before the end of today. Unless it's our, oh my gosh. So, um, let's talk real quick about measuring both of these things. So measuring heat, measuring temperature. When we measure temperature, we are going to use Celsius. Degrees C. So we're going to use the Celsius scale. You take a thermometer and you put that into a substance to measure its temperature. What's actually happening is as those molecules are moving around, they bump into the thermometer and they increase the molecular speed of the substance inside the thermometer. It used to be mercury, now it's alcohol. It's used that alcohol red. So you're increasing the molecular speed of those um, molecules inside of the thermometer, and that column begins to go up because. As you increase speed, you expand. As you increase molecular speed, temperature, you expand substance. For heat, we're 
we're going to use calories or joules. J-O-U-L-E-S. Calories or joules. And it's actually from water where we get the standardization of both the calorie and the joule. So as soon as everybody has this, we'll talk about that. You can use Fahrenheit for temperature as well, although we like to use international units in science. That's why we use centigrade. All right, so a calorie or a joule. A calorie, by definition, remember that's energy. This is the energy that is required to increase one gram of water by one degree of centigrade. In other words, how much energy do I have to add to that single gram of water to increase the molecular speed so that we have a one centigrade increase in our water, one degree Celsius. So how can we do this? Well, we could go and we could take out a little cube or a little gram of water, measure out a gram of water, put a thermometer in there, and we can begin to heat it up and we can keep track of how much heat we're putting in. When we get up to one gram, the amount of heat that we use expended for that gram to go one centigrade is going to be one half. This is not the same calorie as you would see on the back of a package of food where it says calories. That's actually, um, that particular calorie is a thousand times less than this calorie here. No, a thousand times more, I'm sorry. A thousand times more, a kilocalorie. So kilocalorie equals one kilogram of water by one degree centigrade. That's going to be your food calories. Okay. Now, in all reality, even though calories are pretty acceptable, it's best to use joules. One joule is equal to 0.239 calories. One calorie equals 4.184 joules. Yeah, 0.239. All right. So in the last couple of minutes here, I got two minutes. So as I add heat. Why doesn't molecular speed increase the same way in water as other materials? So here's a couple water molecules. Okay, so we form these hydrogen bonds. How quickly do they form and reform? A trillionth of a second, and they're constantly forming, right? Now, what does the hydrogen bond actually do? It's actually going to hold those water molecules closer together to keep the structure, right? So, if I'm holding things together, I'm water, this is water, we've just formed a hydrogen bond. Can I move far away? You don't like my example, David? <laughs> so I can't, I can't move around, right? Because I'm affixed to this other molecule of water. And then I maybe will form another molecule over here. What that means is I'm not moving around a whole lot. If I'm not moving around a whole lot, what's my speed like? Slow. Slow. So now I begin to add heat. Heat initially has to go towards breaking the hydrogen bond. So when I input heat into a water substance, it goes towards breaking this hydrogen bond. So it breaks now, but it hasn't increased my average molecular speed yet. I just have broken a couple hydrogen bonds. If I haven't changed my molecular speed, what is my temperature? It's still the same. So then I add a little more heat, and now I begin to actually increase that 
overall molecular speed just a little bit more. So when you begin to add heat into water, you have to add in enough to first break the hydrogen bonds. Other materials, because they're not forming hydrogen bonds, the heat immediately goes into the end of the room molecular temperature, or increase molecular temperature. Does that make sense? So as long as we have hydrogen bonds, uh, heat increase has to go to break those hydrogen bonds before it can begin to influence the molecule's speed. And since it is not hydrogen bonds that determine temperature, but average molecular speed, until those hydrogen bonds begin to be broken, then I can begin to increase my average molecular speed, thereby increasing my temperature. So Lake Superior, summertime, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, day after day after day, all of that heat's being absorbed by the hydrogen bonds and not going towards increasing average molecular temperature. We're not going to have increases in, in neurons, a lot of hydrogen bonds in Lake Superior, right? I mean, we're talking about numbers of hydrogen bonds that we can't even quantify because we don't have molecules large enough. But you go and you take that little kiddie pool and you put it out there, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, day after day after day, pretty soon it's going to be 80 degrees. It starts out at 70, it's now 80 degrees. There are far less hydrogen bonds that have to be broken before we need to increase the molecular speed. So we're going to be boiling before it's not even more It doesn't have to be boiling. In fact, boiling, what's going on there is you've increased enough of the heat so hydrogen bonds are beginning to be broken. And it's not that all the hydrogen bonds just instantly break. They start to break, but other states stay hydrogen bonds. And so they break, work to break. Pretty soon you have a population of molecules that really aren't forming that many hydrogen bonds that now begin to increase in their uh, in the temperature average molecular speed, and pretty soon they are moving so fast that they shift from being liquid to, to, a, soft, uh, to a gas or something, to a vapor still, mm -hmm. and then get released from the, from the water. But we're going to talk about the effects of that. You can think about it, the fastest moving molecules that begin to heat water are the ones that are moving away. So what happens to the water as those fastest moving molecules are removed from the system? that water's temperature is actually going to decrease because you've removed the fastest moving molecules. And we'll talk about that on Wednesday or next week. Have a safe Labor Day. I never send it around. Just because